There's a reason Chuck Palahniuk described his writing as transgressional fiction. His characters are the sore thumbs of a society that abused and discarded them a long time ago. They don't fit in, they see the bullcrap, they try to adapt but they can't and so they're left with no choice but to forge their own path with the people who understand them. When Palahniuk's novel was adapted into a movie in 1999, Brad Pitt and Ed Norton watched the midnight screening of Fight Club at the Venice Film Festival to an audience that was not only unimpressed, but uninterested. Apparently, when Marla, Helena Bonham Carter's character, said her famous line, quote, I haven't been fucked like that since grade school. The festival chief walked out of this screening, which caused the two actors to laugh uproariously and also because they were high. This only underscores the societal maladies of our time. Capitalism is God and consumerism is its messiah. The dead and the half dead they leave in their wake are just the chaff that must be destroyed for the wheat. And if you want to stay alive, you must keep playing the game. Understandably, a lot of people said fuck off to that and were deeply inspired by the film directed by David Fincher. The Matrix was a film with a similar message, but it didn't inspire quite like Fight Club. People literally started their own fight clubs throughout the United States. Teenagers got arrested, motherfuckers were trying to start their own Project Mayhem. I won't go into the plot because you've probably already seen the movie and or read the book. But if you haven't done either, I highly recommend it. However, what I want to do here is talk about the music Fight Club inspired. It's quite a bit, which just goes to show how strong its cultural impact was. Before we get to the obvious stuff, let's talk about the song title first because that's a bit confusing. I believe the song title comes from another movie and novel, 1995's Angels and Insects, which was from the novella titled Morpho Eugenia, which is a species of butterfly. At first, the story resembles nothing in Fight Club, but I have to talk about it, albeit briefly, because the story is fucked and it somehow ties in really well with Fight Club. So this guy named William loves nature, he's a naturalist, and he sees God in nature, but the benefactor he works for feels threatened by science's continuous onslaught on religion, and he's hell-bent on proving that God is real. Yeah, so clearly it was like set in like the 1800s and shit. Both men, but William specifically, are guilty of projection. He projects God onto nature, he projects beauty and innocence onto Eugenia, his fiance and eventual wife, and he projects his idea of femininity to his associate, Maddie. He isn't looking at the world as it is, he only sees what he believes to be true. But by the end of the story, spoiler alert, he journeys to the Amazon with Mati because he realized she loves him and all the nerdy bug stuff they do together. He doesn't realize how Eugenia, a supposed virgin, knows her way around a dick because she was sleeping with her half-brother Edgar who married her when she was a child and was marrying the servants. The children William had with Eugenia weren't his. They were the inbred offspring of Eugenia and Edgar. And when William and Maddie made it to the Amazon, he doesn't see God's perfect design anymore, but quote, the devouring hordes of army ants, the cries of frogs and alligators, the murderous designs of his crew, the monotonous sinister cries of howler monkeys, the unbalancing of his own soul in this green world of vast waste, murderous growth, and lazily aimless mere existence. It is this projection of value that ties in ever so perfectly with the criticism of consumerism in Fight Club. These things that you love so dearly and desire so much do not hold inherent value you are the one who gave these things value. There is no God telling you what is and isn't right or cherished. You decide. 
When it comes to Between Angels and Insects, Jacoby Shadik sings and raps various lines straight from Fight Club. Working jobs that you hate for that shit you don't need and the things you own own you. These are obvious nods to how much we are unaware that there is an obsession about possessions. The music video also borrows from the Fincher film in terms of the somber tone and also in capturing Papa Roach going slow motion, the inside of their bodies, and also transitioning to various angles. Ultimately, the revolution of your heart and mind depends on you. But we can all be thankful Jacoby was reading Palaniuk before recording this epic song. It serves as a reminder to stop being a slave to the system and to stop just thinking about yourself. Next we have Finch's Project Mayhem featuring Glass Jaws Daryl Palumbo. Obviously the title is in reference to Tyler Durden's organization tasked with destroying society's infrastructure and therefore its soul. Drummer Alex Pappas has a tattoo of the words Project Mayhem on his chest. Nate Barcolo sings the chorus with Palumbo screaming through the song, but in terms of songwriting, who knows who wrote what? So if I were to guess, Daryl's screaming was about the narrator's relationship with Marla. Let Sober Up is in reference to her overdose. When they watched Project Mayhem unfold at the end of the movie, that might have inspired the And So We Burn quote. Honestly, who the hell knows, dude? I don't. Nate's chorus sounds like a clever and cryptic synopsis of the book. Can you begin at the ending so I can begin again? is in reference to the beginning of the book which reads, Tyler gets me a job as a waiter. After that, Tyler is pushing a gun in my mouth and saying, the first step to eternal life is you have to die. Yes, the movie essentially starts the same, I just wanted to quote the book. Now, don't misunderstand me, I never meant to create you, only mayhem, is another quote. This is definitely less cryptic, isn't it? The narrator never meant to create Tyler, only mayhem. Honestly, it's a buzzsaw of a song. It was originally just about two minutes long, but producer Mark Trombino added some stuff on the back end. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of that stuff, and I probably forgot about it for that very reason, because I didn't really like that stuff. But those two minutes, those two minutes with Finch and, and Daryl, awesome two minutes. Instead of songs that were inspired by Fight Club, there is an album, an entire album that fueled the writing process. It's Nine Inch Nails' 1994 album, The Downward Spiral. Palaniuk apparently said so himself. Some of the themes on certain songs definitely endorse the anti-consumerist message of Fight Club. Mr. Self-Destruct has lyrics like, I am the needle in your vein, I am the high you can't sustain, I am the pusher, I am a whore, I am the need you have for more. March of the Pigs literally addresses greed with Step right up, march, push. Crawl right up on your knees. Please greed feed. And then gets even more into mayhem with I wanna break it up, I wanna smash it up, I wanna fuck it up, I wanna watch it come down. The Becoming seems to be about Tred Reznor's drug abuse but his mention of another identity in the lines, I'm stuck in this dream, is changing me, I am becoming. The me you know, he had some second thoughts, he's covered with scabs, he's broken and sore, could illustrate the narrator's relationship with Tyler and just fighting in general. So it's pretty uncanny, isn't it? The downward spiral could easily have been the soundtrack to this movie. But we also have Nine Inch Nail songs that were inspired by Fight Club itself. So the song only boasts the lines, because you were never really real to begin with. I just made you up to hurt myself, as well as I'm becoming less defined as the days go by. But this is tame compared to Copy Ovo, which is a direct line from the narrator's dialogue as he hovered over the copy machine at his work. So. The director of Fight Club, David Finchel, directed the music video for only while Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross composed the soundtracks for David Fincher's movies, The Social Network, 
the girl with the dragon tattoo, and Gone Girl. But the connections don't just stop there. Lastly, Reznor, Fincher, and Palahniuk were working on a rock opera for the movie together in 2015, but as far as I'm aware, the project is still incomplete. I think we can all agree on two things. One, this song has absolutely nothing to do with Fight Club. And two, the music video for this song is literally a summary of Fight Club, but with its own twist ending. John Nolan is the narrator or Jack, quote unquote Jack, and Adam Lazaro is Tyler. We go through all the pivotal scenes, such as the hug at the testicular cancer support group, meeting the mysterious Marla, being an office drone, Jack and Tyler meeting for the first time, and the beginning of the fighting. The twist in Cute Without the E is that while Jack, or the narrator, made Tyler as another personality, the person who was really beating him up was a girl? So it seems like the person our narrator was fighting, but lost to, was probably an ex-girlfriend or love interest. Listen, I'm trying not to say something stereotypical about emo stuff, but I mean, this is pretty emo stuff. <laughs> the lyrics of the song point to this. Actually, the whole, the intro alone tells you what the song's about. Your lipstick, his collar, don't bother Angel, I know exactly what goes on. And then there's, which would you prefer? My finger on the trigger or me face down down across your floor. Then you have the subliminals as background vocals later on in the song saying, she'll destroy us all before she's through and find a way to blame somebody else. All in all, it's a very clever music video for a modern day classic. If Fred Durst had seen Fight Club 28 times since Limp Bizkit recorded their song Living It Up, then I think it's safe to say he's probably seen it at least another 28 times since. As of this recording, it's been about 21 years since that song was released on Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water. And this lyric basically proves he's a super fan, does it not? His fame and notoriety helped him become an unlockable character in the Fight Club video game. I hope you know that it, that, that it really existed. A Fight Club video game that came out in 2004 for PlayStation 2 and Xbox and mobile, apparently. Well, maybe it wasn't his fame or notoriety. Maybe it was due to him being senior vice president of a &R at Interscope Records, which was a subsidiary of Universal, which itself was a subsidiary of French media conglomerate Vivendi. And it just so happens that Fight Club, the video game, was released by Vivendi Universal Games. So hey, if you got links like that, maybe someone made a suggestion and maybe people ran with it. Who knows? I don't. Anyway, we should probably also include Jared Leto from 30 Seconds to Mars, after all, he did play Angel Face in the movie. So it'll be like a battle of the bands, and the soundtrack could be the Dust Brothers. Also, Meatloaf played Bob, the guy with the tits in the movie, and the game. So he could either sing along, or fight along, or both. But if you don't want to play the game with a rocker, you could play as Abraham Lincoln. As he is also in the game for some reason. The game, the game is a travesty. The game is a travesty for a number of reasons. Firstly, for a book and movie that's about anti-consumerism, to make a really shitty video game based on these media is just one of the most shameless cash grabs I've ever seen. And secondly, Abraham Lincoln? Really? Okay, well, Okay, I guess he freed the slaves, which was economic exploitation, the likes of which have only been replaced by modern day slavery by later presidents who did not stand for the same moral principles. Okay, fine, you know what? Maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. Well played, Mr. Durst, you somehow evaded my scrutiny yet again. 
We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. He's right. I was. But that doesn't mean that we can't still put our efforts into things we actually care about and value. After all, how else would our favorite musicians, actors, and entrepreneurs have made the things we love so much? I'm thankful every single day that people had the courage to put their values into riffs, beats, and melodies, and then put it out on stage for millions to see. So this is just my two cents, but maybe Project Mayhem won't be actively destroying buildings and stuff. Maybe it's what Chuck Palahniuk and Papa Roach and Nine Inch Nails and others are doing. Inspiring people to think and live in a way that actually makes sense to them instead of following the status quo. They loved this sense of personal liberty so much that they shared it with us. And I'm not saying it's love or anything, but I think I like them too. Thanks for watching.